We're going to pick up our lecture today where we left off talking about how the energy of a system, the internal energy of a system, is the sum of two things. And those two things are the heat and the work of the system. And we talked about how heat, which is given the symbol Q, is really just a measure of kinetic energy. If we add energy to molecules, they start to get more kinetic energy and they move faster. And the way that we perceive that is by an increase in temperature. The other way that a system can get more energy is if something does work on it. If the surroundings are doing work on a system, for it, then you could get a change in your energy due to work. So both heat and work done on the system or by the system change the internal energy of that system. So let's just review for a minute what it looks like if we want to calculate heat or work. To calculate work, you put your chemical reaction inside a closed system and perform the reaction in there. And if the reaction exerts some pressure on the surroundings, you could expand the system and that change in volume gets bigger so we can measure the work of that chemical reaction. Now, if the surroundings were to do work on the system, then instead of an expansion, you'd see a compression. So that's how you would calculate work for some chemical reaction. How would you calculate heat? So if you wanted to find out how much heat energy went into a system, you could put something, for example, a hot plate on it, and you would start to see a change in temperature as you added energy to that system. So remember, we can calculate the heat which is given the symbol Q. If we know the mass of our system, the specific heat of it, and then if we measure the temperature change, the final minus the initial temperature change. So those are the two things that we're really worried about when we're talking about the energy of a chemical reaction. Now the problem that we have is that it's really difficult to measure both heat, the Q part, and the work, the W part, at the same time. So if you want to know the total energy for a chemical reaction, it's actually sort of challenging to, to get to that information. So what can you do instead? You can make a series of compromises instead. If you want to measure the energy of a system, there's really two approaches you could take. One approach would be to suppress the work that's performed by the chemical reaction. You can force all the energy of the reaction to come out as heat and only measure Q. So if you force the work term to zero, you can get delta E by just measuring Q. That's one trick to use. And the way that you do that is using something called a bomb calorimeter. It can be used to measure the internal energy of a system. The other approach you can take is to decide we're just going to ignore the work. It's hard to measure, so we're going to use an open system and only measure Q. Now in that case, we're making a compromise. We can't get to the internal energy if we're not going to measure the work. But what we can measure is something called the enthalpy, delta H. And the enthalpy is just proportional to the heat of the reaction. So if we don't absolutely have to get the delta E, then what we can get away with is measuring delta H. And the tool that's used to do that is called a coffee cup calorimeter. So what do these instruments look like? A bomb calorimeter is a closed system, and you put your reaction inside it and surround it with water, and as you measure the change in temperature of the water, you can figure out how much heat was coming out of that reaction. We'll get into more details of that in just a minute. To measure just delta H instead of the entire heat and work term, if you measure just the heat, what you're using is an open system. You're going to say, I don't care about any change in volume. Let's just do this reaction in an open container and we'll have constant atmospheric pressure under those conditions. We'll do our reaction inside this insulated container. It's usually some kind of styrofoam container. And we'll measure the temperature change inside this cup. And this is called a coffee cup calorimeter. Now, what are the main differences between a bomb calorimeter and a coffee cup calorimeter? A bomb calorimeter uses constant volume, and we'll see why in just a minute. And a coffee cup calorimeter uses constant pressure. So now we've got the idea of these two different instruments, but both are called a calorimeter, so we should try to define what calorimetry is as we go on. It's just a way to measure the amount of heat involved in a chemical process. 
So a calorie is a unit of energy. This is just a way to measure how much energy is evolved in your chemical process. So let's start first with bomb calorimeters and see if we can understand how those work and why we use them. Remember that the energy of a reaction is the sum of its heat and work. And here's the equation to get work. If your container can expand and we measure a change in volume and a pressure, we can get the work. What happens though if we put our reaction inside a closed metal container, we set off whatever explosion we want to inside this closed container, and all the energy is not going to be able to come out as work because it's closed, it's trapped inside this container. There is no change in volume. Well, in that case, if you forced your, your delta V term to be zero, then all of your energy is coming out in the Q term. And that's actually kind of a nice trick. Now, what are you measuring though? If you put your thermometer inside a water bath that's around this metal container, what you're really measuring is the change in temperature of the surroundings. The change in temperature of not the interior here, but the exterior here. So as the heat comes out, we'll measure the temperature of the surroundings. But we know that the temperature of the surroundings and the temperature of the system are related. So let's agree that we're going to just measure Q in this process to get to the internal energy. And that's the trick we'll use, is to force the work term to be zero. So what about the gruesome details here? The gruesome details are, we're really measuring the heat change of the calorimeter, since we're measuring the heat of the surroundings. But that heat of the calorimeter is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the heat of the system. So if we measure the heat of the calorimeter, we can get to the heat of the reaction if we want to. So what will the heat of the system be? It's the delta T, the final temperature minus initial temperature in this water bath, times the heat capacity of the calorimeter. What's the heat capacity? Remember, that's the intrinsic property that all substances have that regulate how much energy is required to change its temperature. So each calorimeter will have a unique heat capacity that's related to the amount of water in it and the material that it's made out of. Now, if that sounds complicated to get at the heat capacity of the calorimeter, it is, but fortunately the manufacturers of the calorimeter have to tell you what it is. So you don't have to worry about going about measuring that. So what we'll get is the, the heat for the reaction by taking the negative heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T and that negative comes in because it was the delta T of the surroundings that we measured, but we're really after the heat of the system. So let me show you an example of what that looks like so that you can calculate the delta E for a reaction. And the last trick that we have to mention is that delta E typically has units of kilojoules per mole. So there's usually going to be unit conversions in this process to get to the right kilojoules per mole units. So here's an example. Suppose you want to know how much energy is evolved when you burn some sugar. Now, sugar is a pretty high energy substance, so the way to find out how many calories it has, or how many kilojoules per mole it has, is you'd stick this inside a bomb and you'd start the reaction of burning it. So if we measure the temperature uh, in the water surrounding this reaction and we see that it goes up a little bit we can measure how much energy is coming out of that sugar as it burns. So our task is to find delta E in kilojoules per mole for burning a mole of sugar. So let's write down the information that we have right now. What we have is that we know the heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T will give us the heat of the calorimeter. And the heat of the calorimeter is equal in magnitude and opposite sign in sign to the heat of the reaction. Other information that we could write down pretty quickly is the molar mass of sugar, 342.3 grams per mole. What else could we write down? We could write down that delta E is the heat of the reaction divided by the moles and has units of kilojoules per mole. So we've got some equations that we're going to work with. Now let's get at measuring each part of it. The heat capacity of the calorimeter is proportional to delta T, so let's go after delta T. Delta T is the final temperature minus the initial. So delta T for the surroundings for the calorimeter was 3.41 degrees Celsius. Well, what else could we go after? Let's look at the other information we need.
we're going to need the moles of sugar that we burned. And what we have up here is the grams of sugar. So let's convert grams to moles because we're going to need it down here. One gram of sugar divided by the molar mass would give us the number of moles. So now we've got more or less everything we need to start plugging in numbers. We can calculate the heat of the calorimeter. That's the heat capacity times delta T. The heat capacity of the calorimeter was given to us in the problem. The heat capacity of the calorimeter is 4.9 kilojoules per degree Celsius. If we multiply that by delta T, we get Q, the Q of the calorimeter. And remember, we have to put a negative sign in front of it to go from the Q of the calorimeter to the Q of the reaction. So that's the heat evolved by the reaction, 16.7 kilojoules. So now we've almost got delta E. Delta E is the heat divided by the number of moles. So let's plug that in. Here's the heat divided by the moles of sugar. And we've got the delta E for this burning sugar process. Now you can imagine that the calorimeters are a little bit expensive and they're a little bit dangerous to use, frankly. The bomb calorimeters might explode on you if you're putting some explosive substances inside. So is there an easier way to get at the heat without going through all of this business? Let's go back to our little flow chart. If we forced all the energy out as heat, we used a bomb calorimeter. What if we ignore the work term, use an open system, and only measure Q? In that case, we won't be able to get delta E, but we can get a term called enthalpy, and that's given the symbol delta H. We can measure the enthalpy, delta H, at constant pressure, and that is just the heat or the uh, gained or lost by their reaction. It also has units of kilojoules per mole bow. So we'll use something called a coffee cup calorimeter instead. How does that look? It looks like styrofoam cups with a thermometer inside. You might have a cork lid that is not going to seal it, um, but it might insulate it a little bit and you put a stir inside it. So you put, you fill this up with water you put your reactants inside it, react them in the water, and measure the temperature of the water. Now this is a little bit cheaper to use and probably a little bit safer to use. So if you've got this set up, how does it work? Well, you measure the heat of the solution, typically. The temperature of the water. You're going to measure the, this water that's the surroundings, it's not the system. So you'll measure the uh, mass of the solution, the specific heat of the solution, the delta T, and that'll give you the heat of the solution. And to get at the heat of the reaction, we have to put a negative sign in it because the heat that is in the solution came out of that reaction. So once we have that, we really have delta H because that's the heat of the reaction if we've divided by the number of moles of reactants. So let's see how a problem like that might look. Let's suppose you dissolve eight grams of ammonium nitrate in 50 milliliters of water. You measure the starting temperature, 34 degrees Celsius, and you see that the temperature drops to 22 degrees Celsius. Let's calculate delta H, the enthalpy change for the reaction in kilojoules per mole. Here's the heat capacity of the water, and here's the density of water. How are we gonna go about this? Well, if we measure the change in temperature of the water, that's the heat of the surroundings. So we need to remember that the heat of the system is the negative of the heat of the surroundings. So what are the surroundings? The surroundings are 50 milliliters of water. And if we want to use our system of ammonium nitrate dissolving in the water, then we can plug in the mass of the water, the specific heat of the water, and the delta T of the water, and get the heat of the surroundings and then go into the heat of the system, the ammonium nitrate, just by taking the negative sign. So let's calculate the heat of the surroundings. I'm converting the milliliters of water to grams using the density. Here's the specific heat of water, and here's the temperature change, the final minus the initial. And that's the number of joules involved in dissolving the ammonium nitrate. Now we've got to take the negative sign of that, so negative and negative makes this positive 2500 joules, and that's the heat of the system. Now we're almost done. We're almost done. The last step is to remember that enthalpy has units of kilojoules per mole, and this has units right now of just joules. So let's convert this 
from joules to kilojoules and divide by the number of moles. So 2,500 joules is 2.5 kilojoules divided by the number of moles from that. How did we get that? That's just 8 grams divided by the molar mass. And here's the enthalpy for your reaction. You can see the processes are pretty similar, whether you're getting delta E or delta H, but it does mean that you've made a little compromise if you're just measuring delta H. So the reaction we just talked about, dissolving ammonium nitrate in water, caused the temperature of the water to get colder. And that's sort of an interesting result. When the water got colder, because this reaction required energy from the water to proceed, so the water lost energy as this reaction proceeded, then the delta H of this reaction is a positive 25 kilojoules per mole. That positive sign tells you that heat went into this reaction. Heat was absorbed by the reaction and that caused the surroundings to get cold. So another way to write this is writing heat as a reactant, heat going into this process to make it occur. When you have heat entering the system like this, it's called a special word. The word is endothermic for endo meaning entering the system. Now when heat enters the system like this, you will always have a positive delta H. All endothermic reactions have a positive delta H because that means that energy is going into the reaction to make it occur. What's the opposite of that? What's the converse? The converse is exothermic reactions. In these reactions, heat is released by the reaction and the surroundings get hot. So an example would be burning methanol. If you took methanol and combined it with oxygen, you'd get water and CO2 as products, but you would get a lot of heat. You know from your experience burning things that it produces heat and the surroundings get hot. The energy, the enthalpy involved in this reaction is negative 700 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot of energy coming out of this reaction. If heat is released when you burn something, that means the surroundings get hot. And so you could think of heat as a product of this reaction. So anytime you have heat exiting the system, the term used to describe that is exothermic. Thermic meaning heat and exo meaning exiting. And for all exothermic reactions like this one, the enthalpy, the delta H, is negative. So if you see a reaction written down, and even if you don't know whether it's a combustion reaction or something else, if you look at the delta H, you can tell whether heat is going to come out, because delta H will be negative if it does, or delta H is positive if, you, if heat is required to make the reaction go. So the next question is, let's say when you burn your methanol and you get your 700 kilojoules per mole out, let's say you might want to get more heat. This is what you would do if you were trying to cook a burger on a propane stove. You might need more heat to finish cooking your burger, so you might just increase the, num the number of moles of propane that you're burning. So if one mole produces 700 kilojoules of heat, how much heat would be produced if you burn two moles, twice as much? Now logically, you're probably thinking that twice as much heat would be produced, and you'd be right. Two moles of methanol, you just multiply it by the conversion factor of the number of kilojoules that came out for one mole, and you'll see that you get twice as much heat when you burn twice as much fuel. Now that we know the words exo and endothermic, let's talk about two useful thermochemical reactions. One reaction is found in a cold pack. A cold pack has urea in it and a little packet of water, and when you break the packet open, the urea dissolves. And the water, the surroundings of the urea, get cold. And that's why you have a nice cold pack to reduce swelling on your sports-related injuries. So if this gets cold, that must mean the reaction is what? Endo or exothermic? Probably you're thinking that the reaction is endothermic because the water got colder, putting heat into the urea to dissolve it. So if the surroundings get cold, then the reaction is endothermic. Let's look at what happens in a hot pack. A hot pack usually contains something like magnesium sulfate and a little packet of water, and if you want it to get hot, you break the water open and start to dissolve the magnesium sulfate. And when you do that, the water, the surrounding of the magnesium sulfate, will get hot. And the reaction in that case, if the surroundings get hot, is exothermic because heat was exiting the magnesium sulfate and heating up the water. Now, not all 
Thermochemical processes involve an actual chemical reaction. Some physical changes also involve thermochemistry. So let's look at physical changes going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. And you remember that solid materials do not have a lot of kinetic energy. They don't have much motion. They're fixed in space. Liquids have more kinetic energy. They have more motion. And gases have even more, the most kinetic energy of the three phases. So the gas is the highest kinetic energy state, and the solid is the lowest kinetic energy state. So let's say you want to melt something. Melting is going from solid to liquid. Would melting be exothermic or endothermic? Well, if you start in a low kinetic energy state and go to a high one, you're going to need to supply energy. You have to put energy in. And the word for putting energy in is endothermic. Melting is endothermic because liquids have blank kinetic energy than solids. Is that blank more or is that blank less? Hopefully you're thinking that liquids have more kinetic energy than solids, so you have to put energy in to go from solid to liquid. Let's think about freezing. Freezing is the opposite. Freezing is going from a liquid to a solid. So high kinetic energy state to low kinetic energy state means that your liquid is losing energy so energy must exit it, it's exothermic, because solids have less kinetic energy than liquids. So now that we've got that idea, let's characterize each change as endo or exothermic, and let's give the sign for delta H. Vaporization, liquid to gas, is that endo or exothermic? Hopefully you're thinking that's a change from a, a lower kinetic energy state to a higher kinetic energy state. So you have to increase the amount of energy that's in your system. So you have to put energy in, and that's endothermic. And remember, the sign of delta H for all endothermic reactions will be positive. How about condensation? That's going from a gas to a liquid. That's a really high kinetic energy state to a lower kinetic energy state. So the gas has to lose energy. Energy has to go out of it in order to, for this change to occur. In that case, this is an exothermic process, and what's the sign of delta H? Delta H will be less than zero, so it will be negative. Let's look at this reaction. If you're burning natural gas to heat your home, you're burning methane and combining it with oxygen, and anytime you combust something, it makes sense that heat's a product. Heat will come out. So if heat's coming out of this reaction, it must be exothermic, and delta H will be negative. Our last example is this process, CO2 plus water making methane and oxygen. Now, does this reaction look familiar to you? It's just the reaction above it, but written in the reverse. Let's take the reaction in the burning direction produces heat. If we want to reverse it, we're going to have to put heat in. We're going to have to add a lot of heat to make this reaction work. So this reaction would be endothermic and the delta H would be positive.